Are we ready? Yep. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks again that we can study together. We give thanks for the truths that you've been revealing. And we ask that your mercy and love attend us and that you forgive us of our sins. Father, help us to walk in your ways perfectly by your guidance with your word and your Holy Spirit. We pray these here meetings be a blessing to those who watch them. Help me to deliver the message in a way which is clear and understanding to your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is uh, my sixth presentation on a Bible-based chronological study with a focus on the book of Judges. Uh, I talked about the chronology of chronologies that the Lord is leading us into. Um, we had seen like there's a wide-angle view to things uh, from establishing the date of when Jehoiachin was taken captive. We can springboard back to when creation uh, began. You know, we can have sort of place a date to that, and we'd put it as 40, 46 BC. Uh, we had looked at the ceasing of the manna, and that there was applied from 1980. There was a Glacier View meeting. There was a falling of the stars. Theodore was um, converted. To Christian Christianity, and that their exact period of the ceasing of the man from the man well, from when the matter began until it ceased uh, can be exactly the same time period from when uh, Theodore became a Christian, and July 18. Then we looked at uh, the last presentation about 300 years of the ark being at Shiloh, and. Uh, just looked at some uh, chronological patterns that just just once you get this correct uh, chronology, there's all these here time structures just seem to come into place. And I uh, had referenced uh, Ezekiel chapter one talks about wheels within wheels, and there, what appeared to be confusion to Ezekiel, he then sees it as perfect harmony. And I think we had applied Ezekiel to this movement. And then when we are looking at previously to this year movement in history, chronology, it's hard to reconcile a lot of the, these here dates and so forth. But now things are now coming into perfect harmony for us. In this year presentation, I want to just look a bit further into establishing 1533 BC as the date of the Exodus. And then I will discuss the period concerning Joshua and the elders who outlived him, and um, Othniel. So I'll just uh, trying to get it. someone just phone me on Skype. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't so want to turn off your sound. You can do yeah. That. It won't bother you. Turn off the mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so well, after establishing the date 1533 BC, I will look at Joshua and the others who outlived him, and 
a better, better bite off nail as well. That sort of time period, so uh, that trans, trans, what's that word? <laughs> Going across from Joshua to uh, the early judges. So concerning the events in 1533 BC, we had looked at, there's this here date being mentioned when they enter the wilderness of sin. And it's given in the Exodus chapter 16, verse 1. It talks about the 15th day of the second month. And we had uh, uh, Theodore, he read that when we looked at that uh, presentation. Um, we've done that sort of uh, subject in the presentation a day or two ago. And uh, we can determine then that the 16th day of the second month was when the manna began to fall. And that would have been a Sunday. And if you go to the calendar converter, you can see there, this is the, the second day of the, of the second month on the 15th day. And this is the year 1533 BC. And it equates to May the, the 26th in the Julian calendar. And you can see there that it's a Saturday. So the, the, the 16th day then following that would be where the manna fell. So it fits in perfectly the, that this year date, 1533. Uh, that would be a support for, for this year year, it being the date of the Exodus. If you go to 1493 and 1492, and even 1491, now 1491 was when Usher considered that being the date of the Exodus, uh, but the 15th day of the second month there was a Wednesday. Um, in 1492, it was a Friday, and in 1493, it was a Monday. So neither of them dates would have been sufficient to identify as a period of the, uh, the Exodus. Yeah. Now, I looked at Usher closely because Usher believed that um, the calendar in, that was being used by the Jews up until the Babylonian captivity was something similar to the Egyptian calendar. And he had the start of the year as, as being with the equinox, that is, the start of the year in the fall. So he believed that the first of Tishri would be uh, the autumnal equinox. And, and I don't remember all of the details, but I tried to figure out if he had even paid attention to the day of the week in this story, and it appears he didn't. So he didn't try to establish which day of the week it was for that year. Um, he, he, the only one he seems to do that for is just the first day of creation, which he wants to have on a Sunday, of course. And so October 22, 404 BC ends up being uh, the last day before the, the autumnal equinox. So he has the autumnal equinox mark that. But then he's just not consistent in doing that. But there's also so much evidence that shows that the idea that the Jews used uh, Egyptian style calendar, it, it just does not work. Um, part of the reason why he believed that was because he looked at the calendar simplistically in the year of the flood, and so he was taking it as 30 day months, because that's what the Egyptian calendar does, but they had five extra days at the end of the year to get the 365, so he was saying they had five or six days to match it up with the year, mm -hmm. but um, it still doesn't really pan out, you know, the, the flood account doesn't make sense. So, so w as far as I know, we're the only ones who really paid attention to this whole story of the days of the week in the Exodus. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that, Theodore. So we have another span of time given by Ellen White that this year also is uh, evidence to um, extend that period. So Usher, he took that 480 years and took it to the time of the Exodus. But what we're saying is that that period 
or 480 years in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, is applying to when the Israelites uh, crossed the River Jordan and entered the land of Canaan. And that was 40 years after they came out of uh, Egypt. So there would be an extra 40 years at it. Uh, so that's why Usher was looking around 1491. Um, we're saying it's going to be 40 years extra uh, that the, the exodus occurred because we're adding up um, in 40 years to your, um, of the wilderness wandering um, beyond them 480 years that we find in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. So it talks about 400 years of deferred judgment for Amalek. In uh, Pedrach's from Prophets, page 627, paragraph 3. Um, Theodore, would you be able to read that for me, please? Okay, so... I'll get it on my screen. The Lord sent his servant, Samuel, with another message to Saul. The prophet said... And thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. The Amalekites had been the first to make war upon Israel in the wilderness, and for this sin together with their defiance of God and their debasing idolatry. The Lord, through Moses, had pronounced sentence upon them. By divine direction, the history of their cruelty toward Israel had been recorded with the command, Thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. For four hundred years, the execution of this sentence had been deferred, but the Amalekites had not turned from their sins. The Lord knew that this wicked people would, if it were possible, blot out his people and his worship from the earth. Now the time had come for the sentence, so long delayed to be executed. Okay, thank you. So Ellen White references 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 2 to 3. It also references the command found in Deuteronomy, to destroy the, the Amalekites. Uh, this was given by Moses just before his death, and a short time before the Israelites crossed the River Jordan in 1493 BC. If the 400 years were to commence from when the sentence was then delivered to the children of Israel, it signifies that the command for the destruction of Amalek would have taken place in 1093 BC, some four years into Saul's reign. However, in reading the context of the command in Deuteronomy, we can derive a slightly later date of which to begin the 400 years. So it says in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 to 19, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how, you met, how he met thee, by the way, and spoke the hidden hindmost part of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore, it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek, from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. So, I would put uh, Moses delivering this here sermon in, in uh, early, in 1493 BC. I, I think we, there's a date that talks about the 11th month. So, the first day of the 11th month in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, I think verse 3. And that would equate to about the 20th of February in that year. Uh, but he's saying, when you get rest from your enemies round about, so that's when they, they've conquered the land of, of, of 
Canaan. They've set up their tabernacle and they've been uh, given their inheritance to some level that they were then to enact that decree upon Amalek. So from this here passage we can determine that it was only after the children of Israel had defeated the nations in Canaan and and had rest from their enemies that they were then to execute the sentence pronounced upon Amalek. Joshua 14 verse 15 tells us the land had rest from war after Caleb, then 85 years old, had seized possession of Hebron, which can be dated to 1487 BC, six years after the crossing of the Jordan. From then, 400 years brings us to 1087 BC, the year of Saul and the year that David was born. So I think we had originally sort of connected to the fourth year of Saul, but I'm, I'm thinking it's, uh, it's going to be after they've conquered the land that then they were supposed, as to, according to what okay. Moses was saying, they were then in a position then to destroy Amalek. And so then 400 years then takes us to 1097 and uh, Saul reigns 40 years and then David, he's 30 when he begins to reign. So you can count back that David began, well, he was born in the 10th year after Saul was reigning 10 years anyway. So, uh, so I would say that's, that is putting it 10 years into Saul's reign. So if you're going to buy, go and buy the idea that with Usher, that, um, let's see if I, I'll just draw it here, the screen. So with Usher, he has, say, 14, I'll just put his date, 1491. And he has this year, period of 480 years. Um, that goes from there, from the Exodus to the fourth, the fourth year of Solomon and the temple. And then you have 84 years of the kings of the United Kingdom, so David and Solomon. And that would leave a period of uh, 300 and I think... Uh, it's about 356 or something, isn't it? Six, well, he has it there. It's about 350 years anyway. Mm -hmm. So if that was the Exodus, then you're going to have, well, um, well then I suppose that's maybe. <laughs> and maybe I need to a stop Well, it's not going to work out. No. He's, he's going to be too short. Yeah, it's, it's, what it's going to do is it's going to put these 400 years uh, going like in the 10 years into David's reign mm -hmm. rather than uh, Saul's reign. And um, it's, uh, Ellen White would have needed to have said something like, yeah, 360 years rather than 400. So I just think that's, uh, it, it makes her statement uh, a, a lot more credible when you have the exodus taking place in 1533 BC. The main point for me was whether Ellen White was talking about exactly 400 years or not. Um, all I didn't want to have with Ellen White's statements was a clear contradiction of the chronology because I know she can round things up or down. Um, but if she had said, uh, you know, something like 360 years, then I would know, well, we're wrong. So, mm -hmm. so it was after I had worked out the chronology that I really started looking at Ellen White's statements. Now, there are a few statements she makes that are contradictory or, or very imprecise, where she talks about a thousand years between Abraham and Christ. And it's like, well, it's obviously not correct. It's like 2,000 years. Um, but, 
you know, it's something that she had written, uh, not really, I mean, obviously it wasn't something she wrote for publication, it was published later. So I think sometimes some of the things that she's written um, are sort of round figures, but they're obviously, you know, that one's wrong, but it's not like she prepared it for publication that way. So this mm -hmm. is prepared for publication, this statement here, mm -hmm. Patriarchs and Prophets. Yes. Okay, thank you. So just a summary of the support for 1533. We have Psalm 114. Okay, that sort of suggests that coming out of Egypt is a 40-year period. That ends with the crossing of the River Jordan rather than the just the crossing of the Red Sea. We have a statement by Ezekiel in chapter 20, verse 36. He says that they, when they went into, uh, when they sort of rebelled in the wilderness, that was in, they were in the wilderness of Egypt. So in a sense, they still were not fully out of Egypt if they're in the wilderness of Egypt. We have these here astronomical calculations. So as the, the chronology associated with the falling of the manna and when it ceased. So also supports, uh, I think we also seen there in 1493, it's also a good date to recognize for when that manna ceased. So that sort of fits in. We've Elm White quote here that we just read about the 400 years of deferred judgment on Amalek. And we have time structures that come to be seen when you have this here chronology correct. And there's the number 1533, which is associated with a manifestation of the power of God. Now, I haven't dealt with that but that, that's referring to uh, a statement uh, Ellen White makes in Great Controversy, page 611. She says, The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world, and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in, area, in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century, but these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the, the last warning of the third angel. So she's not providing specifically the dates in 1840 to 1840 here. For, um, but in, she does refer to pre previously to Josiah Litch and his prophecy which occurred in 1840. And that we have understood ended on the 11th of August, 1840. And we know that the, the, the Millerites really continued until the 10th day of the seventh month uh, in the 1844, which was the 22nd of October. If you uh, calculate the number of days between them dates, it comes to 1,533 days. And so we can associate them days with a glorious manifestation of the power of God. So this here fits in with the, the time structures, sort of as like spans of time relating to a date as well. We had seen that with 70 AD, and then there's, there's 70 years of Babylonian captivity. They're sort of connected in, in, in the structure. And then concerning the, the year 1533 BC, when the Israelites had came out of Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai, and then they were given the law. And concerning that, Elmite says, never since man was created had there been witnessed such a manifestation of divine power as, the, as when the law was proclaimed from, Mount, from Sinai. Amid the most terrific convulsions of nature, the voice of God, like a trumpet, was heard from the cloud. The mountain was shaken from base to summit, and the hosts of Israel, pale and trembling with terror, lay upon their faces upon the earth. He whose voice shook the earth has declared, yet once more I will shake not, on, not the earth only, but also heaven. In that coming day, the heaven itself shall depart as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island shall be moved out of its place. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and transgression shall fall and not rise again. So what was taking place in 
1533 BC was a manifestation of the power, of divine power, and we have 1533 days, was, which was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. So sort of similar language. And then she goes on to, to say what was taking place on Mount Sinai was relating to the last great day of earth when uh, Christ comes in the clouds and we have the last plagues and so forth. And this was something which Miller was anticipating and in the movement that was occurring in 1840 to 1844. So just another time structure relating to 1533. We had yesterday identified the flood occurring, or sorry, not the, the flood itself, but the 120 years that Moses began to build the ark, 120 years before the flood, so that occurred in 2510 BC. The flood then occurred uh, in 2390 BC, and you have a period there of 120 years. Now, if you go 1,533 years from that prophecy from when it was given, you come to the time of the dividing of the kingdom. And there, Jeroboam sets up two golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel. And he says, these are your gods that have brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he sets up this here false worship on the 15th day of the 8th month, which we can take as a, we could, like a Millerite time period. It was uh, the 15th of August was uh, the midnight cry in Exeter. So that sort of connects with that uh, symbology. But if you, um, if you go 1900, sorry, 977 years, it'll take you to the time of the Exodus. And you have there, when Moses went up the mount, uh, the, the children of Israel, they're going to worship the golden calf that's being set up. Um, again, that's what Aaron says, these are thy God, this is thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So it's just a very similar uh, story with what happens in the time of Jeroboam. And we have these here time structures, these dates, this, the 1533 years uh, as a time and a date, and the 977 as a time and a date. So I think this is again further evidence that uh, 1533 is uh, the date of the Exodus. So chronological considerations concerning Joshua and the elders, elders who outlived him. So two of which would be Eleazar and Phineas. And then I want to discuss about Othniel as well. So I had done this here diagram concerning the 300 years that we find in Judges 11 verse 26. And this is based upon Gerhard Gertoux's understanding He's going to shorten the time of Ehud to 20 years and make various applications that this here, 80 years, goes from the time Eglon is killed to when uh, Deborah and Barak then defeat the armies of Jabin. And then they, there's 40 years of the rest of the land occurs until you get Midian uh, being uh, the, uh, the oppressor of Israel at that their time. So I want to focus on this here period here. In doing this here, it would make the crossing of the Jordan uh, from that their time to when the, the elders who outlived Joshua die, a period of 40 years, until uh, Kushan, Rishathaim, rule oppresses Israel for eight years. And... There's not much statements concerning the time period of when uh, Joshua lived. I, I was saying that uh, at the most he ruled Israel uh, for 30 years because of a statement Elle might makes. She says, except for Caleb, Joshua was the eldest, oldest person. Um, sorry, except for Joshua, 
Caleb was the oldest person in the, la in the, the nation of Israel. So that would have made Joshua slightly older than Caleb. And if Caleb was saying, in the context, Caleb was 85 years old. So therefore, I'm saying that at the, at the least, that Joshua would have been 86 years old. And that would have meant that after he had given the land rest, that the most he ruled was a period of 24 years. Um, but we don't have any specific time for how long Joshua came to, but we, the Bible says here a long time. Ellen White, she quotes um, Joshua ch chapter 23, verse 1, when she says in this context, the wars and conquests ended. Joshua had withdrawn to the peaceful retirement of his home in Tidnaf Sirah, and it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua called for all Israel and for, the, for, and for their elders and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. So all we know that it is, is it's a long time. At the most, it's going to be 24 years after the land is, re is at rest. Again, she says, some years had passed since the people had settled in their possessions and already could be seen cropping up the same evils that had hitherto brought judgments upon Israel. As Joshua felt the infirmities of age stealing upon him and realized that his work must soon close, he was filled with anxiety for the future of his people. It was with more than a father's interest that he addressed them, as they gathered once more about the aged chief. Yet have, yet have seen, he said, sorry, ye have seen, he said, all that the Lord thy all that the Lord thy, all that the Lord your God hath done unto you, unto, sorry, all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you, for the Lord your God is He that has fought for you. Although the Israelites had been subdued, or sorry, although the Canaanites had been subdued, they still possessed a considerable portion of the land promised to Israel, and Joshua exhorted his people not to settle down at ease and forget the Lord's command to utterly dispossess the idolatrous nations. So, some years, a long time, is kind of very vague terms there. Um, but I think, I, I tend to like the idea that Joshua was the same age as Moses uh, when he crossed the River Jordan. And um, we know he lived till 110, so he would have lived uh, ruled then for 30 years, if that was the case. Uh, judges... 40 years between... Jo or that'd be... Um, so he was 40 when Moses was 120, is that what yeah. you're saying? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so when Moses caught, crossed the Red Sea, he would have been 80 when Joshua crossed the Jordan, he would have been 80. That's what you're trying to say. Okay. I kind of like that idea, but I can't prove it. It is possible. So Ellen White, after, well, so uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 7, tells us, And all the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the, all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So Ellen White, after quoting this first comments, Joshua's life of steadfast integrity closed. His voice was no longer heard in reproof and warning. One by one, the faithful sentinels who had crossed the Jordan laid off their armor. A new generation came on the scene of action. The people departed from God. Their worship was mingled with erroneous principles and ambitious pride. So even though it's uh, saying that the people served the Lord, the previous quote there we had read that Joshua had witnessed that there were still, there were things were beginning to deteriorate. So it's like a gradual process. Um, concerning these faithful sentinels who had crossed the Jordan with Joshua and Caleb and your consider, considered elders would apply to those who were 19 years of age 
and younger at the time of the spying of the land. These would have been the oldest people in Israel next to Joshua and Caleb. Upon the entering of the promised land, from whom there would have been an age gap of at least 20 years. So after these elders died, Israel forgot God and were subdued by the king of Mesopotamia for eight years. In their distress, they remembered the wonderful, wonderful works of God and began to cry unto him. And the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Othniel, Caleb's younger brother, and the Lord delivered the king of Mesopotamia into his hand. So this is going back just slightly, just after um, Joshua died, I think. Um, well, it just talks about these here little ones. So these would be the elders. So Numbers 14, verse 29 and 31 says, describes them as little ones. It says, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which you have murmured against me, but your little ones which you said should be a prey will I bring in, and they shall know that ye have despised, and, and, ye, and they shall know that the, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. So Israel has crossed the Red Sea, they've gone to Mount Sinai, and then they've gone to possess the land. The spies are sent in. There's a, a naval report brought back by ten of them. And the people despise the land, and God says, I see your judgment upon them. Your little ones will come in, but uh, you will not enter into the promised land. So they were going to be dying within about 39 years of that time, while those who were very young, and 19, up to 19 years old, were going to cross into the land of Canaan. And amongst them, Aaron's son and grandson, Eliezer and Phineas, could then be considered as part of these little ones, or faithful sentinels, as Ellen White says, for but for this to be so, Eliezer would have had to have fathered Phineas when he was at the most 18 years old, 18 years of age. He would have been ministering in the tabernacle when he was under 20 years old. Uh, this was prior to the setting of the minimum age limit of 30 years that was imposed upon the descendants of Levi in Numbers chapter 4. Another consequence of Eliezer being under 20 years old, after spying of the land, is that Aaron, he was then 84 years old at that their time when the land was spied, would have had to have fathered Eliezer when he was at least 65 years old. Okay, Stephen, mm -hmm. so couldn't there just be exceptions to that idea that that generation dies in the land? That, you know, these people who are priests and so forth mm -hmm. aren't included in that? that they would be, you know, younger than Joshua, mm -hmm. but not, you know, really. There could be exceptions, but I don't think there needs to be. Yeah, there doesn't need to be. But, I mean, it is common just when you say Jotham, um, you know, he survives the slaughter of the 70 sons. But it says 70 were killed, mm -hmm. but only 69 were. And, and it is kind of a Hebrew idiom. We do that sometimes mm -hmm. too, but it's very common in the Bible that they will say, you know, these all died in faith having not received the promise, but obviously Enoch didn't, Enoch, die. Enoch didn't die. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there can be exceptions in that, yes. but it would just be of the general people. But we can, we, we can see them exceptions. Yeah, you know? but we could see these exceptions possibly as well. But it, I understand what you're saying. I'm just I, saying it is yes. possible that mm -hmm. there are exceptions. My personal understanding is that uh, apart from Joshua and Caleb, the only ones then when that spying of the land took place were those 19 years of age and younger crossed into the Jordan. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that Phineas and Eleazar would have been under 19 years of age. Um, because Phineas is Eliezer's father, therefore he would be at the most 18 years of age when he had fathered 
Phineas because Phineas actually uh, was born just prior, I believe, to the plagues. So in the context of Exodus chapter, 20, chapter 6, verse 25, it says um, that uh, Eliezer, Aaron's son, took him, one of the daughters of Bethuel, to wife, and she bare him Phineas. This is mentioned prior to the occurrence of any of the ten plagues that were brought upon Egypt. So I don't, it's not unreasonable, you know, mm -hmm. so you fathered your father and you were 18, so mm -hmm. it's sort of, it's, it's not a, I don't, I don't think there's any need to sort of make any, any exception in this yeah. here case. Um, so there it says about, uh, in Joshua chapter 24, verses 29 to 33, tells us, and it came to pass that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old, and Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phinehas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. So in this context, I'm saying that Eliezer dies sometime soon after Joshua. Uh, it doesn't give the exact uh, time period, but I, th I wouldn't, don't think it's too long. Um, so Joseph Benson uh, states in his commentary that Eliezer died about the same time with Joshua as Aaron did in the same year with Moses. So he brings that a parallel with Moses to Joshua and Aaron. To, as to Eliezer and Joshua. So I just think that's uh, worth considering. Um, this here period of Eliezer dying and then Phineas uh, becoming the high priest then uh, allows us to sort of date the later period of the Judges that we find in chapter 17 to 21. So Judges chapter 20 verse 28 tells us and the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant was there in those days. So when I'm reading that, um, this is probably written by Samuel, I'm thinking, that, uh, that he's saying that, because he's maybe in a time when, so the Ark of the Covenant was there, but it was probably, no, we know that it was in Shiloh. So I think, I think that's the context there, that they gather in Shiloh. And so it isn't in Shiloh when this is being written. So probably Samuel is writing this. And he says, And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. So here we see that Phineas acted as a high priest during the period of the events set forth in these chapters. He is known for his act of slaying, of staying a plague, and thrusting through a man and a woman with a javelin at Baal Peor. This was shortly before the children of Israel were to enter the Promised Land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So Phineas would have to have had been 40 years old at that time. And then they cross the River Jordan, and then Joshua rules, potentially, I think, 30 years. Eliezer continues as high priest for maybe another year or two, and then Phineas is going to become the, uh, the high priest. So this would uh, make, I believe, Phineas, when he becomes high priest, He's going to be about 70 years old. And these here chapters of chapter 17 to 21 potentially are occurring around 1450 BC, uh, being over 200 years prior to the events surrounding the life of Samson uh, that we read about in the previous chapters, 13 to 16. So Phineas could, should then be included in the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. 
of which we are told that in those days the people served the Lord. But I think there's exceptions to this, as I would say an exception to this would be what we read about in chapters 17 to 21 uh, concerning Benjamin and what they did to the concubine that visited Gibeah um, with a Levite and what they were trying to do with that Levite. So you, you wouldn't say that they were serving the Lord. I think this is an exception to that time. And then, so Phineas would then maybe, you can maybe say that he was an exception. So but, uh, I would tend to say that, that, that the serving of the Lord at that there time was an exception and that Phineas was the high priest during this here time and because then you would have had um, sort of running into the time when Cushion Ristotheum oppressed them. Uh, so the events um, yeah so I, I want to try and draw it out in the timeline. These here I just stop sharing. Just sort of going over what I, I mentioned there. Just how we do them for time. Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. So this is the uh, Exodus. And this is the crossing of the Jordan and entering Canaan. This is a period of 40 years. And after they cross the Red Sea, they go to Mount Sinai and they're there for a, just over, well, maybe just under a year. And then they come out of there and go and spy out the land for 40 days around this time, and this would be like a, say one year and four months pro approximately. I don't know for sure. And this is uh, going to be when Joshua and Caleb are told they're going to cross here, and those who are between zero and 19 as well as Joshua and Caleb, and Caleb, Caleb are going to cross at this here point here. So, amongst these here people is going to be Eleazar and Phineas. I think that's how you spell it. I'm not too sure, maybe. Might not have an H. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, so for Eliezer to be 19 here, he would need to have been fathering. Uh, so this would be a period of 18 years. So Phineas would probably have been born around this year time, just before they cross, before the, the plagues and before they cross the Red Sea. And this year point here, um, Aaron, he's going to die. And that's Aaron. And he's going to be 123. So therefore, he would be about 65 years old when he fathers uh, Eliezer. I'm going to just put in here that Joshua rules Israel that's uh, for a period of 30 years. Could be less than that, but it's not going to be more than that. Um, yeah. And then he's going to die aged 110. And Eliezer is going to die soon after that. But um, we're not given precisely how long but it doesn't seem to be too long. And Phineas is then going to be a high priest. And he's going to be about 70 years old. Phineas, um, maybe, well, maybe 70 to 72, we'll say. 
and then Eliezer, he's going to be about 88 to 90 years old when he dies, approximately. And these little ones, um, you can sort of gauge how old they're going to be here, so you just add about 39 years, so maybe about 38 years old, um, at the least, to about 67. Is that right? From 57, we would say, approximately, or 58. 30, maybe 39 to 58, maybe. <laughs> we'll do that. And um, so here they would, 30 years later, they would be like um, 69 to 88, is that right? <laughs> okay. Um, so they're already quite old at this year time, if we're going to be considering these here. Uh, 30 years, if it's going to be when uh, Joshua is, is judging. And they're maybe going to outlive him, I'd say, not at the most, maybe 10 years, according to the, the chronology there we've seen with uh, Gerhard Gerto, uh, with reducing the period of 80 years of Ehud, considered associated with Ehud. So they would maybe live to about 79 to, 80, to 98 years old before all of them are, are sort of um, die out. And then you're going to have the eight years associated with Kushan, Rishathim, and then there's going to be raised up Othniel. So Othniel's not going to be considered with these here elders who outlived Israel. Um, we're given some chronology, chronology uh, associated with him that um, it's not precise, but we can uh, sort of give a, an idea. Um, so, yeah, we'll just discuss about Athos Othniel. I'll just share again. Share again. So um, if you go on to read then about Judges, uh, the book starts, says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So this is around this year period here. So maybe Eliezer, he's still um, the high priest. And just before Phineas becomes the high priest, that we can maybe place these here events to chapter chapter one, verses one to nine of the book of Judges. And I'll not go into detail, but uh, Judah then joins with Simeon, and they attack the Canaanites. And then there talks about a king in Bezek called Adonai Bezek, and they fight against him. He had cut off the thumbs and the toes, the big toes, of 70 kings. And he's going to get his thumbs and big toes cut off as well. And then uh, the children of Judah, they're going to fight against Jerusalem and take it. And they're going to burn it. And afterwards, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. So this is going to be taking place potentially around this year period of time after they came out of uh, into Canaan about 30 years maybe. So I just need to blow my nose and just, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so um, Judges uh, verses 10 to 13 
is, seems to be like a repeat of what we find in the book of Joshua. It says in Judah, so this is like a, going back in time. This would be taking us back to when they conquered Canaan in six years. And uh, Caleb then was 85 years old. And it seems to be sort of, if you read it, you think it's maybe taking, taking place after Joshua had died, but it seems to be like a, a repeat of this here history that's taking place here. And I'm saying that Othniel here, Othniel, I think that's maybe spelt wrong. Oth. <laughs> N-I-E-L-N. Okay. Um, so it seems to be that Othniel here is going to take some city and Caleb's going to give his daughter to him for wife. And it says there, and Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron, and the name of Hebron before was Kerbeth Arba, and they slew Shethai, Ahiman, and Talmai, whom I believe are the three sons of Anak it talks about later on. Uh, and thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir, and the name of Debir before was Kerth Jeth Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerth Jeth Sefer, and taketh it to him, while I give Ashath Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kinez, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Ashath Aksa, his daughter, to wife. So this is quite similar to what we read in Judges chapter 11, sorry, Joshua chapter 11, verses 21 to 23. And at that time came Joshua, the son of, sorry, and at that their time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed the them utterly all, with all their cities. And there was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashod there remained. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. So the land of rest occurs after um, Caleb destroys those of Hebron and it mentions there in Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron and judges there and then it mentions the Anakims from the mountains from Hebron there in Joshua chapter 11 so it seems to be like a parallel um, passage this is the section here we had read previously and not read it all again, but this is when Caleb is 85 years old. He's going to want to take Hebron and defeat the, the, the giants that are dwelling there. Um, later on in Joshua chapter 15, verses 13 to 17, it's, it repeats that passage uh, that we find connected with Othniel. Uh, it says, And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part of his children of Judah, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which, is, which, which city is Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Sheshai, Ahaman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. And he went up thence to the inhabitants of the beer, and the name of the beer before was Kurjus Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kurjus Sefer, and taketh it to him, will I give Ashath, Ashtha, Aksa, <laughs> my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenes, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. Um, so, we're time finish? Well, yeah. So the point of this, is there um, a period in where we could mark that they they get rest from their enemies? 
like you have the six years. I know yes. the Jews mark two periods of seven years, mm -hmm. but they probably do one as inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, well, you could mark six, seven years if you're going to include Heshbon and yeah. Aror mm -hmm. and the cities of Amorites and yeah. Og, Bashan. I, I just think they count inclusive in that six years. Um, but what about when they get rest from their enemies? Mm -hmm. Are you putting a period of time there after those six years? Well, initially, the initial rest I'm putting here, 1487 BC. Mm -hmm. So 30 years, uh, well, 24 years later, it's going to take you to 1463 BC. And this is when I think Joshua dies, mm -hmm. at, at the most anyway. Uh, he dies then. And then um, we have this here, Judah then, mm -hmm. going in against Bezek, yeah. the king of Bezek. So there's another kind of, uh, uh, there's now my statement says that. Yeah, but so this they, is they, gonna they, be before, mm -hmm. so this is, they, they're entering into Canaan, there's mm -hmm. still this period of time. Mm -hmm. All these different events happen. And then the elders, so when the elders particularly die, you're going to place that as, that's when um, Kushan Rishathayim comes into play? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's just, you're, you're filling in that period mm -hmm. there. Yes. And so that's going to be placed where? So I'm thinking there's going to be a 10-year period. Okay, a 10 these, and then... And then there's going to be half that eight years of yeah. Christian. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll get Othniel. And, and I'm saying... And, and Othniel, he's, he's there long before that. So he's fairly mm -hmm. old by the time that he comes against Kushan mm -hmm. Rishathim. So I'm saying chapters 17 to 21 are yeah. taking place in this... In that 10 years. Yeah, period. okay. So even though it says that they served the Lord all the time of Israel, in a sense, you can certainly see the rest of the, rest of the, the, rest of the tribes, apart from maybe Benjamin and Dan, are pr still pretty zealous for the Lord in a sense they're still. So I think there's maybe exceptions there, but I think as a general thing that they are still serving the Lord. You have Phineas there, so they're generally for him. Um, Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll close the prayer. Mm. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your love and mercy towards us. And um, we give thanks for helping us to understand these passages a bit clearer. There is still some uncertainty concerning exactly the time when some of the events occurred, but we can have a, a general idea, and we pray that this year study has helped to, in a way, in a measure anyway, place some of these events in the right order. And uh, we ask that uh, that be a blessing to those who have, uh, who understand these things, and uh, be with us as we uh, go into our next presentation. Be with Theodore. And bless him as he uh, seeks to share your word with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.